Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast, episode number 288, How Measurement Fails Us. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Maupin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about hormone replacement therapy for women, which is available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at BioBalance Health. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. One of the things that almost everybody that has a professional degree has to study at some point in their education is statistics. And statistics, uh, as it is taught in universities, is focused depending on the kind of educating you, education that you are getting. Uh, but a, a euphemism that is frequently used is that figures never lie, but liars always figure. And what I was taught in school is that you have to use statistics and you have to know what the statistics are. You have to figure out things like the bell curve and one standard deviation, two standard deviations, all that kind of stuff for uh, data interpretation because data is just data and, and we need to find a way to make sense out of the data that we use and so we try to do that and we're taught to do that but what we want to talk about today is how a focus on data can be destructive if it is uh, excessive and, and microscopic and, and it tends to be like a cancer. Once you start accumulating data, if you have the capacity to do it, computer systems or, or whatever, then you start counting more and more things, you know, like uh, Sesame Street and the count. You just count <laughs> everything. And keep counting. And then you try to figure out, well, now that we have all this stuff counted, can we make a picture that makes sense? Uh, so that, that's expensive, and it's expensive in ways that we may not recognize. And so today, Dr. Moffin and I want to talk about how measurement systems, and especially with electronic medical records, which are all mandated for doctors' offices to maintain now, so that we can accumulate all this data and we can play with all these statistics. And we have interpreters and interpolators and and measurers and quantifiers and analysts and people that play with the data. And what we don't have are problem solvers. What we don't have are problem solvers. (laughs) Uh, And and it impacts medicine in ways that we, we don't necessarily appreciate that it impacts. So we want to talk about that. Most patients don't know this. Yeah. Most patients don't know that every piece of information that goes into Medicare or Medicaid, which are federal uh, systems, is being gathered and being used to rate your doctor. And it is being used to rate your hospital. It's being used to rate healthcare in general. So what they do is they give us parameters as physicians, if Mm -hmm. we're working in those systems, that we have to fulfill. And every year, it is more and more things we have to type into the patient chart so that they can do data mining of your information, and we're doing it in a system where we have a certain amount of time to spend with the patient, and that time includes... Doing, doing your typing, doing your documentation. So doctors are then judged by what they put in the chart. Now, there's only this amount of time to spend with a patient. If you every year spend more time, which is over here, on your documentation, then you have less and less time to spend face-to-face with your patient. Well, and that's why I say it's like a cancer. And that is, uh, patients don't know the backstory, but they right. know that more and more now commonly when they go to see their doctor, the doctor's looking at the computer screen and not them. And it's asking the standardized checklist that's on the computer that they're accountable for. It gives us a bad reputation. And not <laughs> just talking to you and looking at you and saying, are you better? You look better. You look worse. I'm concerned about this. You didn't mention that, you know, that they see the mm-hmm. way they used to. Communication is, is key to physician, patient, relationship, but that's not like we're going to go out to dinner relationship. That's like, I can tell by knowing you and and knowing what you look like or what you look like last time, Mm -hmm. if you're getting better or not, I need to be able to know you enough to get you to communicate with me what your problems are. So you trust me. Mm -hmm. You don't trust somebody who's doing this. I mean, I've gone to dentists even that do that. I have a wonderful dentist. I will never give her up. 
but I went to one dentist in, in the last 25 years that wasn't this particular dentist. Mm -hmm. And he just sat there and typed the whole time while he was talking to me. He never once looked at me. Then he'd look at my teeth and he went back to typing. And I thought, I'm never coming back here again. This is just terrible patient communication. So that's not in the medical field, but this, this whole data problem <laughs> isn't telling us the right things. They're looking at the wrong kind of data and they're judging everything on that. That's what's determining your lack or poor medical care. Ideally, the reason for doing this is a good thing. Let's find out what works. Let's find the best way to treat these different illnesses or symptoms that people present with. But what happens, and that's why I said it's like a cancer, it's insidious. Uh, is that the cost control managers eventually get control of the system. Mm -hmm. And then it all begins to be about controlling costs. In, in my the profession, tail wags the dog. Yeah. Uh, in, in the counseling profession, when I first went into practice 30-something years ago, the attorneys that I spoke to about setting up my practice said, if you don't need to take notes, don't take them. Because the only thing that your notes will ever be used for <laughs> is if somebody wants mm -hmm. to sue you and they can subpoena your notes. And then we can, we can take decisions that were made in a context out of context and crucify you on the stand or attempt to. Mm -hmm. and, and you'll have to remember and, and what have you. And, and so don't document it if you don't have to document it. Mm -hmm. That was 30 then, years ago, though. Then the evolution in counseling controls occurred mm -hmm. and to control the market. They start accumulating all the data. They want us to, and, and now we're ethically required to keep the notes and to take them within 24 hours of a session. So within 24 hours of me seeing That's you, tough. I have to make notes about what we said, what we did, what I asked, what I, and I have to document. You know, I have to ask you: Are you depressed? Are you suicidal? And whatever, and check that. Which is that I inappropriate asked. in many, Absolutely. in many situations. Well, Why would you ask somebody that you're talking to about a marital problem? Who, who seems particularly happy, are you suicidal? You might, you might more readily ask, are they homicidal? Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, because, you know, the idiosyncrasies that you fell in love with 30 years ago that were so cute, 30 years later, they don't call them cute idiosyncrasies, they call them motives. True. So, but, <laughs> uh, but what happened? Not, but, in, our, the, not in our No, not in our marriages, though. <laughs> the, the point that, that I was wanting to make is that over time, it began to be about What's the, uh, who, who's going to pay and how much are they going to pay and mm -hmm. when are they going to pay and what do they pay for? And so I would get questionnaires that I would have to spend time filling out mm -hmm. that I didn't get paid for, but I'd have to spend, you know, a half hour, an hour filling them out uh, for each patient every week or two. Mm -hmm. uh, so they can document what's the average number of visits for depression? What's the average number of visits for anxiety? What's, uh, uh, how many patients do you have? That average are number per year? Uh, for what? To, to get Lifetime? better. So that the, well, because what would happen is managed care mm -hmm. would come in and say, we'll pay, the, you know, you should be able to cure this in 15 visits. So that's all we'll pay for. <laughs> it's one size fits all. It they're, is. they're trying it to give, is. use all this data so to have make all us the data all measurement that says you one only size. get 15 sessions to, to get better. And, and then we have to diagnose you with something else, a segue. You know, that's, you know, so. To so get I, you more visits. Yeah, to get you more visits if, mm -hmm. if we're not through. If we're through, that's great. If you're right. better than 15 visits, if you're better than eight visits, then I don't keep you for the 15. The fact is, is that counselors yeah. and doctors are professionals. By being a professional, you have ethics. Right. Only 5% of doctors and counselors will not follow those ethics. But they that 5% gives us all a bad name and makes all the rules take more time away from taking care of patients. So... We're following all these rules just so that we can, they or somebody, insurance companies, the government can police the 5% of the doctors and counselors and teachers, whatever, that don't play by the rules and that are scamming the system. Now, I don't think that's right. I don't think that's how we should be providing medical care. It has nothing to do with medicine. The, the, the rule, the, the rule of, of the, the practice of medicine and taking care of patients yeah. If you're a, if you're a professional, you should be trusted to order the inform, the data, excuse me, to order the treatment and order the medications that are needed by that patient and order the number of counseling sessions until you feel that that patient is better. Now, if you're going to police all of us to to police the 5%, then just go after the 5%, leave me alone. 
and and that's what should be the way to take care of policing professionals. We should be professional enough not to have to be watched every minute. But I believe that government feels very powerful when they take, and I'll say this out loud, the smartest and the longest trained professionals in this country, which are doctors, and they can squish them and they can control them. I think government feels very powerful about that. They love that. The guys that they hated in high school because they always got better grades, they can now take on and make them do what they say, even if they get to play doctor that way. I know you I believe just, this that. And, really and I know it makes feels me that way to you. And, and so unhappy. And I would argue with you that it isn't government as an entity. It's the money. Follow the money. And what happens is they're redistributing the, the resources towards pharmacies and insurance companies and away from doctors. And, they're not and, taking care of patients. I mean, they are. Every time they that. say we need to cut health care dollars, right. they're talking about what they're going to pay to the doctor. Right. Which is insane because we're not the largest part of health care dollars. Well, when the Congress forbids the government, which is the largest buyer of medicines, and, and from negotiating low-cost medicines. For Medicare and Medicaid. Right. And it says you can't negotiate that. You can't ask them to deal with you on quantity or bulk amounts. That's against the law. So what happens is those systems have a free reign to say, well, this is what we're going to charge for this. And when the Medicare dollars have to be divided, the only control they have is to say to the doctor, you have to provide the service for less money. And so unless the, so why does the government do it? Does it do it because they don't like smart people, they don't like doctors, or does it do it because they're in hock to the people that contribute to their campaigns, yeah. which are big pharma and insurance companies? Right. I mean, doctors so, alone are independent yes. people. They're, they don't have enough money to... They don't aggregate together. Yeah. They're, they don't have billions of dollars to, to throw at one party or another to get their way, yes. which is what we're talking about. So the people that are ruling... Medicine, and I've seen some hilarious Amy Schumer's who are who's yeah. very irreverent, but but having like all the the congressional um, council on women's medicine, they're all men, of course, of course, standing at the end of the table when she's up in stirrups, and they're all deciding whether she needs a pap smear or not. Right. So I mean, that's how bad going, it going is. Going back to the data, man. and that's how exactly what happened. What's the evidence? How many? <clears throat> you know, uh, we read this article that started us thinking about this conversation that was in the New York Times about medicine and education and the use mm -hmm. of data management uh, and testing. Uh, and, it, and the article said that the average emergency room physician does four thousand computer clicks in a ten-hour shift. Four thousand computer clicks. So. In 10 hours, that's how much time is he like looking at the patient and how much true. time is he doing uh -huh. other things? And you were telling me that this was happening even before you stopped doing surgeries, uh -huh. that you had to go in and put into the computer system all the information about the surgery. And, and Well, I always had to dictate, and dictation's fine. But what, I, what they did was to save money, as soon as the computer system came into, and I will say it, Mercy Systems, because it's not true of every hospital, okay. they fired all the secretaries on, in the whole hospital. The secretaries are people who coordinate care. You have an emergency, you're taking care of the patient, they, write, they put the order into the computer and they get you blood, they get you medicine, they have, I mean, they put in all your orders that you've put in, but they put them in officially, which takes a long time. Uh -huh. That's their whole job. So they shifted their job to the on doctors you. because we're not paid by the hospital. Right. We have privileges. I don't know if everybody knows that, but when your doctor operates at a hospital or delivers babies at a hospital or sees you in the hospital, they're independent in a way from the hospital because they're not paid by the hospital. The hospital gives you the ben the privilege of coming on their land and, and using their services, but you're not paid by them. So if I see someone in the ER, I'm not going to get paid because the doctor from the hospital sees that or, or gets paid for that patient. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to get paid. I go go because I want to take care of that patient. Right. It's out of the goodness of my heart. I'm not sending a, I can't send a bill because mm -hmm. there's already a bill being sent to the hospital. So that's the kind of thing. I do rounds. So that is paid for in my uh, in my delivery uh, fee, but I'm doing rounds in their hospital, but I'm not paid to put orders in. Mm -hmm. And I had cer several circumstances where I needed blood and it was an emergency. Somebody 
popped a stitch in post-op. Mm -hmm. There was no one there but me, and the system was new, and I was having to figure out how to get how to blood. So I called the blood bank, yeah. and they go, we can't do this without an order. Yeah. And I'm like, look, patient's going to expire, you know, expire yeah. if you right. don't get me some blood. And so I had to have... I had to go through three administrators and I had to go through all, I mean, I wasted tons of time while my patient's sitting there I mean, needing out. Yeah. blood. We all know what she needs. We, we all, all know where it is. And it used you to be a it. phone call. I need yeah. two units of O negative or whatever she was. Right. And, and I can't do anything. Mm -hmm. And I am, I think my blood pressure almost so popped. On, it's on not the because they're not listening to me. It's not because I'm bossy. It's because... My patient needed something, and no, and doctors need to have people helping them so get that. As in a, a hospital. physician, you have to sign a death certificate if the patient dies. <laughs> I don't. I've never so, had to sign a death so certificate. Thank you, God. Do, do, do you put on the death certificate death by medical ineptitude or bureaucratic ineptitude? Um, I could, but there is no number for that. The <laughs> yeah. hospital doesn't give us a number. Yeah. You know that kind of thing. So yeah. we can't really put that in, but. That would just be that I would be in front of a committee yelling at me if I did that because you're never supposed to implicate the hospital in anything. You're not. I mean, you have to answer right. a question. Even though you don't work for them. Even though I don't work for them, I could lose my privileges, not be able to deliver babies. But after that incident, I realized that it was dangerous mm -hmm. for me to be working at that hospital. It's dangerous for my patients. And if somebody else wanted to do that, I've been at many different hospital systems. I just decided I didn't need to do surgery anymore. I would rather take care of hormones and just stay in my office and not deal with this because it was dangerous for my patients. Well, I don't know that I made the same decision for the same reason that it was dangerous for my patients, but I made the decision to get out of working for insurance companies. Yes. When you, when, when you go into practice, uh, everybody in, in the American system is conditioned that uh, just hand you their insurance card and you process with the insurance company and get your payment and they pay a copay. So the insurance companies began to be more and more demanding of data and you would have to fill out treatment plans. You'd have to send them in for approval. Somebody looking at a computer that had a high school education would read what the computer said was the suggested best treatment plan. And mm -hmm. you'd have to spend an hour on the phone debating with them whether the computer was going to authorize your treatment. And Which, they, to me, is just the they, practice of yeah. medicine, and they don't have a license to practice medicine. No, they don't, but they're making those decisions, or at least they're they're. And everybody should be really unhappy about decisions. that. <laughs> and they would tell me, we will only give you six visits for this. Uh, I had one uh, patient that was suicidal adolescent. And his parents changed jobs and changed insurance companies. So it's a different provider. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't on the provider list for the new mm -hmm. company. So they assigned a new provider. And the parents said, no, he's suicidal. He has a relationship with this man. We're making progress. We want him to stay. And they said, all our people That's are licensed. They're qualified. That's too bad. He has to move over. Well, and there was no discussion with me about... We are widgets. Yeah. We are not really, you know, like one doctor may be better at one thing than another. Mm -hmm. But Blue when Blue Cross came into my office and said, we don't care if you leave our... It's either take it or leave it. If they right. decrease what they pay you, you can't negotiate a price. You negotiate, you just say, they, they've got all the money. They've got all, all the power. So they say... Well, you're off our panel. If you don't want to do what we're, we're offering you, it is not a negotiation. It's a take it or leave it. Then they said, well, we'll just take all these patients that you have and we'll replace you by sending them to other doctors. And I said, so you think that my patients, after all these years, are just going to just up and leave because you're paying for it at another doctor? And they said, we and don't care. They said, we don't care. Right. We don't care. You are you are just like every other doctor. We'll replace you with You're somebody an else. Part. And that, that's when I left Blue Cross. I mean, it was like one thing at a time. That, that happened in my business too, because they would say to me, "We'll authorize five treatments in a uh, twenty day period, twenty five day period." So you have to track the days and the sessions. And if you mm -hmm. see them outside the days, if they're good until the twentieth, and you see them on the twenty first, <clears throat> right? Then you don't get paid for that. Right. And you cannot bill the patient. Right. That's and you can't bill the you. patient either. You throw that hour away. Uh, or, or if you see them six times because of a crisis instead of mm -hmm. five times, you can't bill for the sixth time. And so you have to eat it. Yeah. And I mean, this is, it sounds like the complaining of people who, you know, have tons of money and all this and stuff. And we're all just a bunch of whiners. But the deal is, is that 
Many doctors spend half their day trying to decide how they're going to pay payroll for their employees because they're small business owners. They have to figure out how to get enough money in. And for, for an OB, you have to wait the nine months somebody's pregnant plus six weeks after their delivery to even send a bill. Then you get paid about uh, two years, basically, after someone has, has gotten pregnant. So you've, you've taken care, care all this time, yeah. and you don't get paid for two years. There's no other business that does that. Right. I mean, but they get away with it. Mm-hmm. So they're, because it, the measurements favor the insurance company. And all of the contracts favor them. Right. So, so what I'm saying is your insurance is your doctor, unless your doctor fights or your doctor refuses to take insurance, and then you have to pay. Right. So and you can get reimbursed, that's a then huge you have to problem. fight with the insurance company. And that's what happened with me. I... I voluntarily left all of the insurance panels mm-hmm. that I was on said, I am not going to be a provider for anybody anymore. And I won't take insurance as a primary payment. Mm-hmm. So I said to my patients, I'm in a cash basis system. You have to pay me. I'll give you the paperwork you need. Mm-hmm. And then you can negotiate we with do your that insurance as well. company about reimbursement. Mm-hmm. They don't like that because they're not used to that. Right. I, but I we used to do it a long time ago. We used because to you're that. cash basis. Mm-hmm. Now. Uh, a lot of the people that I know have switched to cash basis uh, because the system strangles you. And, and so then the question that we started the day with, how do we know what's best in medicine? How do we know what the best care, uh, what things should we be measuring? And we have to move away from the myopic checkbox list on the computer uh, and the computer analysis of what standard of care. But they only be. look four months in advance or three months in advance, a quarter. Mm-hmm. So how can you tell if somebody's better in a quarter. So my my problem solving brain says mm-hmm. we should take a doctor's first year in practice because we have to we have to we can't take one doctor and compare them to another doctor because we all have different types of patients. I have a a, a practice that is in the county of St. Louis, not in the city. Right. The city practices are much more high risk and much and and they're poor patients care and all that. And they have lots of drugs and lots of other things that, that that's a practice that is very difficult. Mm-hmm. That takes a lot more time and energy to take mm-hmm. care of patients than mine. So I'm, I'm kind of arguing against myself, mm-hmm. but what I'd like to do, see is they take your first year in practice and then they compare how much progress you've made with patients over the years. Like every year did these patients that you were seeing at this point, are they, are they less ill? Are they healthier? Are they not going to nursing homes? God forbid, did they die? You know, if that would take points off, but, but look at my practice, my patient population, and then see if I'm getting better, if I'm improving the lives of patients, not just looking at a, a three month you can't do anything in three months in medicine, really, except pellets. They'll make you better in three months, but, but, but not other things. They're not going to make you. Diabetes isn't treated in three months. I mean, you need a lot longer, win, bigger window. So for me, it is compare a doctor to himself. It's like golf, kind yeah. of. You don't compare it to others. You compare them to yourself. How much right. have you improved the lives of your patients? And that would be a fair way of doing this. But what they're doing now is comparing everybody and and to themselves to other people who are in different circumstances Mm -hmm. so that's that ends up being a a poor way of judging i remember when when um claire mccaskill before she became a senator Mm -hmm. united states senator she asked me how to measure health Mm -hmm. well at that time i didn't have a good answer that was quite a while ago but now i do have an answer Mm -hmm. and part of it is this measuring to yourself Mm-hmm. And the other part is you have to leave you have to leave money out of it, which is what they want to leave in it. Right. Because money, if you you are decreasing care, um, money, if you go cheap, you're not going to get health in general. But I mean, if somebody needs a surgery, they don't get it. That's cheap. But then they could die, or they could live in pain the rest of their lives. So that's quality of life. But it's cheaper, and the cheapest thing is for all of us to die. Because then there's no medical care. Right. So for us, this is one of this is not a way to judge medical care. So we have we, we can talk about this for eons. But for eons. Right. This uh, this is but basically you can't judge medical care by how much it costs. And and so to summarize, 
What I learned about statistics is that to make the point that you want to make, what you need to do is increase or decrease the basis of comparison. And so you change your data pool and you can come up and prove any point that you want to point that's legitimate mm -hmm. and honest and accurate, but it's front loaded because you set out to prove a case rather than to look at the data and see what does it mm -hmm. say. So please be aware that it's endlessly frustrating when you get caught in that system. It's dangerous when you get caught in that mm -hmm. system because you're being treated by bean counters who are really treating your money and not you. Mm -hmm. uh, so healthcare is a secondary or tertiary level of concern, mm -hmm. not the first level of concern. So be active in your own health consumption in terms of talking to your legislature, talking to your congressman, talking to your doctor, talking to everybody you can talk to to say, I don't like this system, there's something wrong with it, and we need to change it. Thank you. Thank you. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.